Are you a priest of the Most High God? If you are born again, washed in the blood of Jesus, and consecrated to him, you are part of a holy priesthood, according to 1 Peter 2.5, and a royal priesthood, according to 1 Peter 2.9. And if that be true, then you have inherited the titles that rested upon the priests in the Old Testament era and have been transferred to the New Testament priesthood. And one of those titles is found in Joel chapter 1, verse 13, that refers to God's people as ministers of the altar. Now, of course, that altar was different then than it is now, but that's one of your callings, and it is a powerful calling. It is a primary calling that you are a minister of the altar. The priests of the Old Testament were the mediators, and those Israelites who came to the tabernacle and later on to the temple had to have a priest to reconcile them to God. And that happened at an altar where a sacrificial animal was offered up. Well, it's shifted dramatically in the New Testament where now the people of the world who are unsaved come into contact with us and we have the word of reconciliation and the ministry of reconciliation and at an altar of repentance, which is spiritual in essence now, we bring them to God and they are reconciled or restored to a right relationship with God. So we are God's representatives in the world. And as ministers of the altar, we are ministers, mediators, messengers, and intercessors. So there's a whole range of callings that rest upon the priests of the Most High God in this era. What is the altar that we take people to? Hebrews chapter 13, verse 10 tells us, it says, we have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. See, certain sacrifices offered up at the altar in the tabernacle in the temple were actually eaten by the priests and by the people that offered those sacrifices. It was like having a feast with God. And now that has shifted up to a spiritual level of fulfillment because Jesus said we have to eat his flesh and drink his blood. That's the meal that we partake of. Of course, it's symbolized by the communion service, but what does it represent? I was raised Catholic where they believe the bread literally turns into the flesh of Jesus. The wine literally turns into the blood of Jesus. I no longer believe in transubstantiation. I believe those are symbols of something far more profound. Not an external ritual, but an internal experience. Because Jesus was the word made flesh. So to eat his flesh is to eat the word and digest it into your life until you become a person who is ruled by the word of God, by the promises and commandments of his word, the blessings and the curses. And in like manner, the life is in the blood of an animal, of a human, and also, the life of God was in the blood of God, and if God ever had blood, it was in the veins of his son. Acts 20, uh, 28 says that we are the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Think of that. And so to drink his blood is to drink in the life of God, and the Holy Spirit is called the spirit of life. So to eat his flesh is to eat the word, to drink his blood is to drink in the spirit, and by those two influences, we are transformed before the God of heaven. What a wonderful privilege and honor and responsibility to partake of that and to share it with others. And that's how we fulfill the call to be ministers of the altar. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. In other words, if they are functioning within the confines of the law, they have no right to partake of that that is available through this age of grace. You have to shift from one to the other. Now, let's go back in time because I want to see how an altar was very essential in the turning points of the human race. 
and altar encounters with God were pivotal moments, defining moments in the lives of certain individuals that not only defined them, but defined their offspring and brought heavenly change in this earthly realm. An altar is a powerful, powerful thing. And if you are a minister of the altar, you have a powerful, powerful privilege. Let's go all the way back to Adam and Eve. In Genesis chapter 3, they were exiled from the Garden of Eden and plunged into the depth of a depraved, fallen nature. Someone taught their sons, Cain and Abel, how to reconnect. And it must have been Adam and Eve who understood the concept of an altar. They must have received it from God. Who knows? We're not told in the Bible. But we do know in the very next chapter, after the exile, comes the reconciliation, where Abel and Cain both brought offerings to God at an altar. And we read in Genesis 4.1, let me let me read at least the first three verses, three or four verses. Now, Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. And she said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, and this time his brother Abel. Now, Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and their fat, and the Lord respected Abel and his offering. Other translations say the Lord was pleased with his offering or the Lord approved his offering. What was wrong with Cain offering the fruit of the ground? Because that was symbolic of human effort, religious efforts at becoming righteous, where Abel's offering was symbolic of a blood sacrifice to justify you in the sight of God. And from the very beginning, God was showing what was essential in reconnecting with him. So, of course, Cain, jealous and angry, but I believe it was more than jealousy and anger. That was the only place in the world where God was moving because God showed some kind of sign that he approved Abel's offering. In fact, later on, He's the first one mentioned in Faith's Hall of Fame in Hebrews chapter 11. Let me read that. Verse 4, by faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. And through it, he, being dead, still speaks. What does that mean? It means that when Cain killed his brother Abel, that God came and rebuked Cain and said, the blood of your brother is speaking to me from the ground. Think of that. The blood of Abel cried out to God from the ground. I'll bring out the meaning of that in just a moment. But God testified of Abel's gifts because he pleased him and he approved of his gift at an altar. So here you have eternity and time, heaven and earth, a holy God and a fallen man reconnecting at an altar where there's a bloody sacrifice, most likely a sacrificial lamb, a firstling of the flock, the firstborn. Think of that. Think of that. That altar was a connecting link. If you and I are ministers of the altar, we, in a sense, not in a weird sense, but a powerful supernatural sense, are able to monitor this passageway back to God so that others can make it that have no idea. They're oblivious to how to get right with God, but we can usher them through the portal, so to speak, and say, you can get to God if you call on the name of Jesus, if you go to the cross, because we have an altar that they have no right to eat of that served the tabernacle, and that altar is Golgotha. It's Calvary, where Jesus was offered up for us. Well, it may not have been an altar like you see in ancient 
altar pictures or depictions of stones laid one on top of each other. But the cross was on top of a hill called Golgotha that is in the shape of a human skull. In a sense, it's a huge altar. And the world can come to that altar and be made righteous instead of sinful. God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. How powerful is that? Two things about Abel. That was the defining moment in his life. The Bible only mentions four things about Abel. Imagine that. His birth, his occupation, his time at an altar, and his death. Four things are mentioned about Abel. And yet one of the four is what brought him honor and placed him at the beginning of the list of men and women of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, because God testified of him. I, I do believe that there was literal fire that fell on the altar. And part of the reason that Cain slew Abel is that fire was the only place in this entire world where the manifestation of the Spirit of God was taking in place, like bugs to a light, it drew demonic attention. And I believe many, many demons swamped that area, swarmed around that happening. And it wasn't just an angry, jealous brother. That anger and that jealousy were like magnets that attracted demonic powers that wanted to manifest through Cain in order to attack Abel. I believe it was all a demonic battle. It was a spiritual battle because the enemy could not stand the thought of God taking this realm over again. But altar people do that. People that pray with passion, people that pray with conviction, people that pray with a burden for lost humanity, people that seek the face of God for revival in our land, that really know how to bury their face in their hands at an altar, whether it's in a living room or in your car or in the backyard or wherever you pray, you know how to create a spiritual altar and connect with heaven. You are more important to the future of this world than you realize. Let's go to one more altar. That's in Genesis chapter 8. Oh, and by the way, even as... Abel's sacrifice caused his voice to be heard after death. I believe if you're an altar person, a minister of the altar, you live at the altar daily, then your voice will be heard after you're gone. People will remember your testimony, your life, what you lived for, what you stood for. Your voice will be known after you're gone. You'll leave a legacy. Genesis chapter 8, verses 20 through 22. Let's read it. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and every clean bird. See, there were seven of every clean animal that were rescued. Six pairs of male and female and one that was saved just to be sacrificed for the others. Very symbolic of those who are really dedicated to ministry. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. A newer translation says the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Well, what was it that God smelled? Was it the aroma of sizzling steak on a grill? If that was what attracted God, there should be a glory cloud over every steakhouse in the land. I don't believe it was the smell that came from the burning meat, but a heart that was burning with devotion toward God. That was the aroma God responded to. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake. Although the imagination of a man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, day and night shall not cease." Apparently, the harvest cycle was not in place until after the flood, so the flood may have been caused by the tilting of the earth. And what caused that to happen, who knows? There's a lot of theories about what really caused the flood, 
and how the earth changed. Many people say there was just one continent and it was surrounded by waters and that fits in with the Bible description. And then after the earth tilted, the continent split apart and Noah's grandson was named Peleg. His name means division because he lived in the days in which the earth was divided. So maybe, just maybe, that's what happened. But we do know that it seems very likely that once the earth tilted and now there's certain seasons when parts of the earth are further away from the sun than at the opposite side of the rotation around the sun or the rotation of the planet and the around the sun in its orbit. So uh, all of these things are theoretical and, and, and something we can think about and imagine as a possibility. But I do know that there was a curse on the entire world. This I do know. How this all happened, I'm not sure. But I do know that the Adamic curse was that the ground would bring forth thorns and thistles. So I believe up until this point of the flood, it had never rained before and the water soaked the grounds, changed the environment dramatically. It had never happened before. And now the curse is lifted where harvest can take place, where crops can be grown successfully. Wow. One man made the difference because he was a minister of the altar. A burnt offering is a symbolic thing that represents the idea of desiring the offerer wants to be consumed with the fire of passion for God. And so the offering that is offered up is symbolic of a desire, a prayerful desire of the heart. And so when Noah offered up burnt offerings, he wasn't just doing it for himself. He was doing it for his family and for the pristine world that now was cleansed by the flood. He was rededicating the planet to God. And God lifted a curse from the entire globe because he had an altar mentality. If Noah could cause a curse to be lifted from the whole earth, then if you are a minister of the altar, couldn't you cause curses to be lifted from family members? Couldn't you cause a curse to be lifted from your entire family? I don't care how corrupt maybe four parents or four grandparents may have been you can say the curse stops with me and and instead start a line of blessing. Praise God for that. You could even be used of God to bring blessing on your city, on your state, on your nation, on the entire world. Who knows how far your influence could be if you fulfill the call to be a minister of the altar. One more. After God appeared to Abraham, his immediate reaction was to build altars. According to God's specifications later on, those altars were made not of hewn stones, but of stones in their natural appearance, exactly what they look like when they're found, because it was traditional and it was a religious rule set in place by God that you defile an altar if you lift up your tool upon the stones to shape them. It had to be a God-shaped altar, not a man-shaped altar. And that speaks volumes because our approach to God must be God-shaped and not man-shaped. There's over 4,000 religions in the world that are man-shaped. It's man's idea of how to reconnect with the supernatural, with ultimate reality. But you've got to approach him with God-shaped concepts, his revealed way of getting back to him. And Abram, I believe, went by that approach. Later on, it was made a rule with Moses in Exodus 20, but I believe it was also a traditional belief. It may or may not have been, but I believe it was. Then the Lord appeared to Abram. This is Genesis 12, verses 7 and 8, right after his initial visitation. And God said, to your descendants, I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord, to Yahweh who had appeared to him, and he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east, and there he built an altar to the Lord. So he pitches his tent between Bethel, that means house of God, 
and Ai on the east, which in essence meant a place of chaos and confusion. So you're, you're in between a world full of chaos and confusion and the house of God. And you build your altar in between in order to connect with heaven. What a powerful thing. And that's found again in Genesis chapter 12, verses 7 and 8. I urge you to build an altar today in your heart. Build an altar in your heart to Yahweh, to the God of heaven and earth. And make up your mind that your defining moments in life are going to be those moments when you connect with heaven. I can look back over my past and see times when I really prayed through after two or three or four hours, or maybe I, I sought God on a lengthy fast and God visited me in a very profound way. And I count those the defining moments of my life. And I do believe that those defining moments were the times that not only caused me to change, but made me an agent of change in this world. And I urge you to have the same kind of mindset. Build an altar today in your heart. Seek God. Call on the name of Jesus. Be like Noah. Be like Abraham. Be like Abel. Do it by faith and enter into the line of heroes of faith that Abel started off.